Chapter 3 We poured out into a bright, warm June afternoon, looked up into the sky, but could see no ball, of course. The news media had said that, despite its great distance from Earth, it was circling Earth every 65 minutes. It wasn't in a free-fall orbit. It was applying continuous power to keep it on its path, although there were no detectable emanations of energy from it. The memory loss had occurred all over the world between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m., Central Standard Time. Those who were not already asleep fell asleep for a minimum of an hour. This had, of course, caused hundreds of thousands of accidents in the U.S. alone. Planes not on automatic pilot had crashed. Trains had collided or been derailed. Ships had sunk. And more than 200,000 had been killed or seriously injured. At least a million vehicle drivers and passengers had been injured. The ambulance and hospital services had found it impossible to handle the situation. The fact that their personnel had been asleep for at least an hour, and that it had taken them some time to recover from their confusion on awakening had aggravated the situation considerably. Many had died who might have lived if immediate service had been available. There were many fires, too, the largest of which were still raging in Tokyo, Athens, Naples, Harlem, and Baltimore. I thought, would beings on a high ethical plane have put us to sleep knowing that so many people would be killed and badly hurt? One curious item had been about two rangers who had been thinning a herd of elephants in Kenya. While sleeping, they had been trampled to death. Whatever it is that's causing this, it's very specific. Only human beings are affected. The optimism which Boynton had given us in the church melted in the sun. That if Boynton's words were prophetic, we were helpless. Whatever the things in the ball, whether living or mechanical, decided to do for us or to us, we were no longer masters of our own fate. Some of them must have been thinking about what the technologically superior whites had done to various aboriginal cultures, all in the name of progress and God. But this would be, must be, different, I thought. Boynton must be right. Surely such an advanced people would not be as we were. Even we are not what we were in the bad old days. We have learned. But then, an advanced technology does not necessarily accompany an advanced ethics. Or whatever, I murmured. What did you say, dear? Carol said. I said, nothing, and shook her hand off my arm. She had clung to it tightly all through the services, as if I were the rock of the ages. I walked over to Judge Payne who's sixty years old but looked this morning as if he were eighty. The many broken veins on his face were red, but underneath them was a sort of grayishness. I said hello and then asked him if things would be normal tomorrow. He didn't seem to know what I was getting at, so I said, The trial will start on time tomorrow? Oh, uh, yes, the trial, he said. Of course, Mark. He laughed winningly and said, Provided that we all haven't forgotten today when we wake up tomorrow. That seemed incredible, and I told him so. It's not law school that makes good lawyers, he said. It's experience, and experience tells us the same damn thing with some trifling variations occurs over and over, day after day. So what makes you think this evil thing won't happen again? And if it does, how are you going to learn from it when you can't remember it? I had no logical argument, and he didn't want to talk any more. He grabbed his wife by the arm and they waded through the crowd, as if they thought they were going to step in a sinkhole and drown in a sea of bodies. This evening, I decided to record on tape what's happened today. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my memory to keep. If I forget while I sleep. Most of the rest of today, I've spent before the TV. 
Carol wasted hours trying to get through the lines to her friends for phone conversations. Three-fourths of the time, she got a busy signal. There were bulletins on the TV asking people not to use the phone except for emergencies, but she paid no attention to it until about eight o'clock. A TV bulletin, for the sixth time in an hour, asked that the lines be kept open. About twenty fires had broken out over the town, and the firemen couldn't be informed of them because of the tie-up. Calls to hospitals had been similarly blocked. I told Carol to knock it off, and we quarreled. Our suppressed hysteria broke loose, and the boys retreated upstairs to their room behind a closed door. Eventually, Carol started crying and threw herself into my arms, and then I cried. We kissed and made up. The boys came down looking as if we had failed them, which we had. For them, it was no longer a fun adventure from some science fiction story. Mike said, Dad, could you help me go over my arithmetic lessons? I didn't feel like it, but I wanted to make it up to him for that savage scene. I said, sure, and then... When I saw what he had to do, I said, But all this? What's the matter with your teacher? I never saw so much. I stopped. Of course. He had forgotten all he'd learned in the last three days of school. He had to do his lessons all over again. This took us until eleven, though we might have gone faster if I hadn't insisted on watching the news every half hour for at least ten minutes. A full thirty minutes were used listening to the president, who came on at nine-thirty. He had nothing to add to what the newsman had said except that, within thirty days, the ball would be completely dealt with, one way or another. If it didn't make some response to our signals within two days, then we would send up a four-man expedition, which would explore the ball. If it can get inside, I thought... If, however, the ball should commit any more hostile acts, then the United States would immediately launch, in conjunction with other nations, rockets armed with H-bombs. Meanwhile, would we all join the president in an interdenominational prayer? We certainly would. At eleven, we put the kids to bed. Tom went to sleep before we were out of the room. But about half an hour later, as I passed the door, I heard a low voice from the TV. I didn't say anything to Mike, even if he did have to go to school next day. At twelve, I made the first part of this tape. But here it is, one minute to one o'clock in the morning. If the same thing happens tonight as happened yesterday, then the night side hemisphere will be affected first. People in the time zone which bisects the South and North Atlantic Oceans and covers the eastern half of Greenland will fall asleep. Just in case it does happen again, all airplanes have been grounded. Right now, the TV is showing the bridge in the salon of the transatlantic liner PAX. It's five o'clock there, but the salon is crowded. The passengers are wearing party hats and confetti, and balloons are floating everywhere. I don't know what they could be celebrating. The captain said a little while ago that the ship is on automatic, but he doesn't expect a repetition of last night. The interviewer said that the governments of the Dayside nations have not been successful keeping people home. We've been getting shots from everywhere. The sirens are wailing all over the world. But, except for the totalitarian nations, the streets of the daytime world are filled with cars. The damned fools just didn't believe it would happen again. Back to the bridge and the salon of the ship. My god. They are falling asleep. The announcers are repeating warnings. Everybody lie down so they won't get hurt by falling. Make sure all home appliances, which might cause fires, are turned off. And so on, and so on. I'm sitting in a chair with a tilted back. Carol's on the sofa. Now I'm on the sofa. Carol just said she wanted to be holding on to me when this horrible thing comes. The announcers are getting hysterical. In a few minutes, New York will be hit. The eastern half of South America is under... The central section is going under. 